Yo vi que Neil Ferguson no estaba usando corbata, entonces me quité la mía. Mucho más cómodo, ¿no? Sí. Y como todos nos queremos parecer a Phil Dellinger, everybody wants to look like Phil. So, we're not wearing a tie either. So. Bueno, muchísimas gracias. Tenemos un caso clínico bien complejo. Así es que, este, ¿cuánto tiempo tenemos para esta discusión? Tenemos una hora que la vamos a utilizar uh, de manera total. I'm saying that I have, uh, lo voy a hacer en inglés, ¿verdad? Lo voy a hacer en inglés. Uh, I, I have an hour here. We have an hour here. We have a very complex case, guys. So, uh, pay attention because we're going to keep asking. I'm going to, uh, everybody feel free to make any comments. And then I will ask specifically Sergio Zanotti, because he's the one who knows the most here, uh, to help us on this. So let's start. This is a woman, uh, past medical history of hepatitis C, related liver cirrhosis, child B, treated with interferon and ribavirin with portal hypertension. No tenemos más datos. We don't have more data about what that means in terms of ascites or anything like that, but we have evidence of portal hypertension. She has type 2 diabetes mellitus since uh, the last three years and admitted with one week of progressive dyspnea, peripheral edema, fever, chest pain, and productive cough. We don't have more information about the type of chest pain, but I will assume that it is a pleuritic chest pain, and I'm making this thing up, uh, but uh, I think uh, that will be reasonable. Her height is 160, her weight is 98 kg with a BMI of 38. Uh, because she has portal hypertension, I'm not so sure if this, there's some ascites there. The mean blood pressure is 59, a little bit tachycardic, 102, very tachypneic of 30, and hypoxemic of 83. She has decreased air entry in the right side and some crackles and heart sound without any abnormalities. She has uh, cold extremities. Uh, with delayed capillary refill time, which I think will go together with the uh, evidence of hypotension and the Glasgow coma scale is 15 points. She's given one liter of normal saline, SS is solución salina, normal saline, uh, 0.9, um, and supplemental oxygen with non-rebreathing mask. Uh, her saturation per cutaneous is 90%. Heart rate is more tachycardic than before. Blood pressure is 60, the mean is 63. And you can read the test result. The hemoglobin is okay. The sodium is low. Platelets are low. Uh, white blood cell count is high. Creatinine is high. Bilirubin, the total is high. BUN is high. And you can read the rest. The PO2 is low. Um, PCO2 is 21. Bicarbonate is low. Uh, and the lactate is very high, 7.35, with a PF, uh, PF, uh, PF uh, ratio of 79. So severely hypoxic, very sick lady. Question one, she was given one liter, I told you, of normal saline. So the question here tries to address if, if there is any specific fluid that you will use, if you have any, not feeling, but any data that one is better than other. Anybody? Which fluid would you use? Does everybody have a, a, a microphone here? No? Yes. What is the normal saline? Yeah. You will use the normal saline? That's, that's what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, for, you, could, you could argue. Right. Uh, my concern, what, what was her orientation? She, the Glasgow Coma Scale was low, 15. So she, I assume that she's confused or she's non responsive. Yeah. Because uh, if, if this was chronic hypotension, you would not have to resuscitate You'd also need to be concerned about you rapidly raising that sodium. So this could be a tricky patient. Yeah. With chronic Hypotension, you need to be resuscitated. Uh, LR still has a, a sodium that's higher than that 120. So, right. You know, if, uh, I can see how you could argue both, and the more I talk about it, I might give it up. 
So you don't have a specific preference. It could be either sailing or your life. Dr. Chabu. I agree uh, with him about the solution, but you mean uh, what you do if you continue for the division or because she already received it? Uh, yes, she got one leader. Yes. One leader. Yeah. I'm not sure that we have to continue in this case. I'm not sure. But so what you mean to say is that you will go to oppressors early? Um, yes. Tell us yes, more sure, a little bit about that. Sure, not yet, sure. <laughs> Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> but if you go back to the uh, previous slide, I think that first because she already listened to it, just probably she has a pneumonia, so I'm not sure that she needs a lot of fluid. Uh, also because I look at so the heart rate is 140 and the dietary blood pressure is 50. Normally, when you have a high heart rate and a tachycardia, you should have a high diastolic blood pressure. It is physics, and more than physiology, it's physiology if you want. So, in this case, we have a low diastolic blood pressure in spite of tachycardia. So, it means that uh, your vascular tone is very, very, very low. And this patient needs urgent vasopressors. This is why I would be very careful about continuing to it. Maybe yes, maybe no. But I would give uh, urgently. Uh, it is not the only measure to, to do urgently, I think. Vasopressors, but for probably mechanical notification. Let, let me ask you uh, um, one follow up question. Uh, she has cirrhosis. I assume she's vasodilated to start with, right? Because of the. So I, I, I shouldn't say vasodilated. She has a low vascular tone yeah. to start with, um, just to be precise here. Um, and she got only one liter. Wouldn't you be concerned that she may need another liter before you give the pressure or you, go, really, you give it at I the would, same time? I would give first as a person. Because she already received one liter, it's not so negligible. What is the, the plasma volume in normal people? It is three liters and a half, normal plasma. So one liter, it's, it's a lot compared to the normal volume of plasma. So I think that it is good that we have to add it normally. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I tend to start norepinephrine with the diastolic pressure that low uh, without any data but just with the rationale that the LV is getting all its blood flow during diastole. And if you have a real low diastole, I tend to start norepinephrine a lot earlier. Early. Neil, do you want to say something? Um, I think that's, I agree with John Louis that I'd be starting pressers early. We'd also I'd probably want to avoid giving a ton of normal saline just because of making the acidosis worse. And in somebody like this, who we think has sepsis, and in the context of liver disease, at a low threshold to give some albumin if she needed more fluid. And I think that I would add and agree with that. I think the type of patient that maybe albumin as part of your presentation would, be, would make sense. But I also agree that the other thing that we didn't address directly here, but I think David mentioned is that Right. Let, let me let me have a follow up question regarding the albumin. Um, in somebody who's septic, uh, the albumin that you infuse will have a high volume of distribution. Wouldn't you be concerned that most of this albumin will go out to the interstitial space and we will cause minimal effect in in, in the intravascular uh, space? Or you, you wouldn't? I'm asking you, Neil. You still give it to her. Yeah, I would still give it to her. I mean, and, and the the rationale for that is that we don't know that it all leaks out, and there's at least some um, hypothesis generating data, subgroup data from the safe study, for example, to look at uh, improved and albios as well. To some signal there that albumin may be helpful in the in the septic subgroup. Anybody for yes? Go ahead. Yes, I would like to add something. Uh, in general, uh, physiologically. Uh, if you have a high permeability, of course, if you give hyperbine albumin, it goes into the interstitial. Into the interstitial. But finally, the clinical studies, uh, many of the clinical studies in septic shock patients show that when you give albumin, the albumin concentration in the blood increases, meaning that maybe this phenomenon is not, is not so important. Yeah, probably. I don't know. 
I, it, and I, and I, I suspect that's the case because her albumin you see is twenty is twenty one, right? Yeah, two point one in Europe. Yeah, twenty one so in, in Canadian units, which is very low. <laughs> but if, I bet you, if we measured her albumin two days ago or a week ago, May have it been. probably might have been relatively normal. Because even well, maybe not with her liver disease, but even normal healthy patients can go from an albumin of four to two in one day because because so, all their albumin leaks out already. So there's already some albumin in the interstitium. So it's a question of uh, you know concentration gradients. Okay, anybody for plasma light? You know, that was very popular with our fellows for, uh, for some period of time because of the marketing of the product. Anybody for that? Nothing against it. I just don't use it in my, my, my ICU that often. Okay. So let's move because this is question one and we have like 20. <laughs> so this is the x-ray. The x-ray showed uh, uh, something in the right base. I'm going to say something because I'm going to show you the CT. I don't have any of the mediastinal windows. I only have the uh, uh, parenchymal window in which shows uh, some probably fluid. Um, I, I cannot say if there is any um, infiltrate there. Uh, I don't see any specific air bronchograms, but you have some fluid there. So the patient was intubated as uh, uh, Sergio wanted, um, and a right thoracentesis was performed, and a pus was obtained. Chest tube was inserted. I don't know how much fluid drained, but I will assume that it was a substantial amount. And then a second uh, fluid bolus of one liter of a Ringer uh, solution was given without improvement on the blood pressure based on what you already have told us that she will improve. So, but we give them antibiotics. Which empiric antibiotic is the best option for this case? Uh, and I know that that question is, is loaded because you're going to say, well, it would depend where you're working, right? In my hospital, this is what I would use. So give us an idea what would be your first reaction. What would you cover? Uh, Sergio? So I think that more than specific antibiotics, the framework I would use is the three factors. Number one is clinically what's going on. Number two is what's going on with pneumonia, maybe. Number two or second factor would be where the comorbidities of this patient, where the patient has to grow to this immunosuppressed. We don't have more about the history, but recent use of antibiotics, previous infections would also be part of my, my analysis. And number three, which is obviously a very local question, is understanding the flora in which you, you, you operate. If some hospitals uh, or some communities have a much more frequent community part of RSA than others, right? So I think that that's something that we need to understand at the local level. But with those three things in, in, in mind, I would obviously start broad. I would be concerned about gram positives and gram negatives, and I would probably, and in my hospital, the combination of the fourth generation that was born, maybe, and the and, 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 and macromycin would be a, a way to start. I don't think that this is a typical, but I did not apply all the any other comments in addition to that? But that will cover in general. Okay. Okay, so, um, so uh, Sergio, I'm going to go after you on this one. You're giving some antibiotics. So we want, uh, do you usually um, measure your glomerular filtration rate? And uh, obviously, or you have a farm D who will help you to do that, right? And adjust the antibiotic doses. And if so, which of these uh, formula do you commonly use? The Crockford Gold, the MDRD, or the CKD uh, API or AP equation, or uh, do you collect urine for some period of time? That's a very easy question to answer. That's whatever my pharmacist tells me. And uh, I, I would rely on my I really can't speak to which one of you to be more precise. Ferguson, do you have anything to add? No, I have, this, I have the same answer. Um, <laughs> but I, I also think it's important to realize that all of these things are, it's, it's a guess, right? And, yeah. and it's, an evolving, it's an evolving situation. You, you use the creatinine today, but with none of these really take into account the the, the changing nature of what's happening to the creatinine as it's going and, and I think the, the team from Nutrition was trying to put this thing just to, to get that, that, that part of the answer and to remind people that in the cirrhotic, there are even more inaccuracies on, on, on this area. And I would say that, I would say that use the same analogy that I would use for heparin and homeroembolism. The goal of first dose is to make, you know, underdose. 
right? So you have to give it a perfect code up front, and then you have time to calculate where to give it. Okay. Any other comment regarding this one? Um, so, John, you, you know which one? You you wanted to give this thing uh, twenty minutes earlier. So, which which would you use? Uh, and, and if you can give us oh, the I rationale. I think that there is a consensus to use first norepinephrine. Yeah. And and okay, so we will use norepinephrine. Um, a, any any disagreement with that? I, I will assume that there is no disagreement on that. Feel? Do you feel? Norepinephrine, the way to go. So, uh, Sergio, they give vancomycin and meropenem. Uh, it's not specifically a, a third generation or fourth generation, but it's meropenem. Uh, it was given norepinephrine at a 0.4 micrograms per kg per minute, uh, and the BP went to 100 over 60. So, um, because you're giving 0.4, would you use hydrocortisone? How many of you will give uh, hydrocortisone on this? Can you can you go back to the, yes? Sorry, because I did not see 160. So no, I, I will not use hydrocortisone in this case because now it's, it's you can live with that. It's, it's, no, we can use in some situation with refractory hypertension, but not now, not now. Okay. Anybody disagreeing with that position? Yeah, we. Uh, I would say that I would use it for sustained 15 mics per minute or higher. I would give the hydrocortisone. Um, you, I would be better off using a micrograms per kilogram, but I don't. Uh, I just use 15 mics per minute or higher. I use that from two sources. Uh, one is the a priori uh, enrollment criteria for the approaches trial, which required a similar dosing uh, for I think hours, and the other. And the other is a pre-designated secondary outcome group from the adrenal, which used a cut point of 15 mics per minute. And if you look at the forest plot, you know, it seems to be that group of people that made up most of the trend in better outcome in the adrenal trial. So you, you will use it? In that yeah, way. how much does she, what, what, is it, what is she on? How many kilograms? That's more than 15. So it's more she, than 15. She, she weighs 100 right. kilos. That's like 40. Yeah, interestingly, the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine, uh, FCCM, uh, corticosteroids, the SIRSA, CC, whatever it is, uh, they actually recommend a lower dose uh, as a suggestion that's even lower than this dose. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. So, um, so she is on volume control, um, and her total volume is 315. Um, respiratory rate, you can read it there. She's an FI2 of 60%, um, with PO2 of 80. Uh, PIP is 10, plateau is 28, um, and the uh, static compliance uh, calculated around 17. And you can see the uh, blood gases there, severe, significant uh, acidosis, uh, metabolic, um, and some respiratory component as well, uh, with a lactate of 10 uh, and a bicarbonate of 10, and the PF ratio of 133. So uh, with this information, the question is, would you recommend uh, a recruitment maneuver in this patient? Or who, who of you will do a recruitment maneuver? Uh, and, and the evidence for that. In this case, I would not uh, perform a recruitment maneuver. I would prune, maybe. Yep. Uh, even if PF ratio is not below 100, but maybe she can she she can she can be proved. But my concern is lactate. Yes. Okay. So shock is 
blood still pressure there. is still is still uh, 160 or lower now. I think I will assume that the blood pressure is still 100 or 60. Is that high? So she probably, I don't know what the, the time period, if, how much time have passed through that if she was able to clear up some lactate, but, but I agree the lactate is still very high. Uh, um, Neil, would you, would you do a recruitment maneuver? Um, I'm, not, I'm not desperate about her, her yeah. level of uh, hypoxemia in this, in this case. I'm, gonna, I'm a little concerned that her, her driving pressure is on the higher side. Being and I'd like to, uh, what, would I, what I'd probably do, I would actually get a, I'd like to see what her heart is doing with, a, with an echo. And we'd probably put an esophageal balloon in this patient to understand yeah. what the true transpulmonary pressure was. Yeah, as I said before, I don't know where the abdomen is here. I don't know if she has ascites and she has a diaphragm being pull, uh, pushed up. Uh, so I, I don't know more uh, detail. So, uh, Sergio, do you disagree with this or we are okay no, with it? I think that the priority, like I said, I think that from, from a big picture, the acidosis is by my main concern. Yep. And I think from a point of perspective, I, I have to be with you on that. Good choices. Also, I mean, these patients, have, and especially getting the US, and they have ascites. The easy thing to do would be to measure intra-abdominal pressure, and there, there might be interventions that might help there as well. That's okay, so we can try that driving pressure. But uh, I guess the maneuver would be my priority. No, and I think the other thing to think of is, is I'd like to know what her chest X-ray or, or ideally what her CT scan looked like after we drained the uh, the, 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 the fluid. Empyema. Because at least from what we saw before, there wasn't a lot of de-recruited lung to right. start off with. So right. the, the, the yeah. first thing I mean, you need to have a successful recruitment maneuver is some de-recruited lung. That's right. And, and we didn't see that, but we don't know. So we will assume that there were some de-recruited lung. There was some atelectasis in the basis. And I'm saying this thing because these people gave them some... Um, a recruitment maneuver, and they did a titration of the of the PEEP, and the best compliance uh, was uh, with a PEEP of, of 14, so I will assume that the PEEP was raised uh, uh, to 14 uh, centimeters of water. Two hours later, the norepinephrine infusion rate was increased to 0.8. Uh, there was a decrease in the urinary output and the lactate still 10. So and this is two hours later. So um, uh, and then they did a series of maneuver just uh, designed uh, for our French professor here to have his comments coming up uh, uh, there. So this is a, a transthoracic echo, um, and I assume uh, uh, this is on a, on peep. Um, I don't know the tidal volume. I will assume it's six mLs. I don't know if it's eight or more. So this is the view. And then the, we are showing this, uh, uh, this, this image with 35%, I think, in the change in the inferior vena cava. So um, from one to the other. And then the VPP, this is animated. So, so does this help you? Does this information help you? This is the four chamber view. Yeah. Um, so, so, the right ventricle is uh, dilated. Uh, uh, it's big. Yeah. Uh, when when you have a tidal volume of six and then per kilogram, it's difficult to interpret PPV pulse pressure variation. Yeah. Uh, and I assume it because they didn't say we increase it to eight. So yes, uh, yes. So PPV seems to be seems to be low. Uh, I didn't calculate it, but uh, seems to be low. So if I want to know more, I would perform a tidal volume challenge consisting in increasing tidal volume just for one minute or less than one minute and to look at the change in PPV. If PPV increases, probably the patient is fluid responsive. This patient is fluid responsive. Or if PPV increases by less than 3%, 3% in absolute value, I would say, uh, probably the patient is not fluid responsive. There is one paper only. We need, we need confirmation of this, but it is a very simple test to do in case of low tidal volume ventilation. So I would, I would do this if I want to know more about this. But I, I, what I want to, to say is, in general, in this kind of situation, with uh, ARDS, relatively severe ARDS, plus very severe shock, uh, 
I would go directly after, of course, transesophageal echocardiography or transthoracic echocardiography. I would go to some advanced hemodynamic monitoring devices to okay. know more about uh, hemodynamics. Because you're asking for that, they give some more fluid and you have some data here regarding the central venous um, blood analysis. And they put a swan against catheter. Um, the initial reading are here with a cardiac index of 2.7 and SBRI of 1,000 1, stroke volume. You, you, you can read the rest there. Uh, you can see the lactate, instead of getting better, is getting worse. Um, so would you use with this data, uh, any of you, would you use anything to, uh, uh, any inotrop, uh, an inotropic agent to help that heart? Can you go back? Sure. <laughs> yes. For this slide. Uh, I, I would say uh, there are many, many anomalies. SVU2 is very low, 53%. Uh, so it means that it could be interesting to measure SVU2, <laughs> even in septic patients. And this morning, uh, I tried to convince people to continue to measure SVU2 because sometimes it can be low and can tell us about. Uh, uh, the adequacy of oxygen delivery, which is not adequate to oxygen consumption in this case. We have a high PCO2 gap, probably due to insufficient calic output. Calic output is not low, but insufficient, probably. So, probably there is a problem of calic output, insufficient calic output, uh, with CO2 gap and with SCVU2. So, I would, uh, of course, in this case, after trans, uh, after echocardiography, in this case, I would give a inotropic drug, yes. I don't know if you agree. Yeah, I think this patient uh, needs an eye intrope, right. uh, for sure. Which one would you use, uh, uh, Phil? I'd use obutamine, but I'm concerned about the heart rate uh, because it, you may be restricted. I, I think dobutamine is a little less likely to drive tachycardia if you have adequate intravascular volume than if you don't. But what the last heart rate was what? I, that's what I was trying to figure out. It's around 140, I thought. So we'll assume that it's 120. Yeah, the other options you give, for me, I can't use levosimendin. We don't have it in the U.S. And milrinone uh, is an option, but you give it knowing you're going to have to go up on your norepi uh, because of, it's an inodilator. Anybody will disagree with that? Are we okay with that? So I'm creating an artificial scenario because I know how it works, but uh, uh, Sergio, do, do you give the butamine first or do you add the vasopressor first? Or you would do both at the so same I think time? That, uh, the it is uh, taking care of the patient who are having blood pressure issues before we put the song out. Right. So we have added at that time. Okay. 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 So they gave the, uh, the butamine uh, at 8 micrograms per kg. Uh, and the norepinephrine, um, and they measure uh, again, and you can see that uh, the performance of the pump improved. Um, the uh, occlusion pressure went down, and all of the rest, you can read that the lactate went from 11 to 7. It's still high, very high, but better than 11. Um, any comments on this? No? Better, right? Uh, so over the next couple of days, the debutamine was uh, eventually was stopped, uh, and the norepinephrine infusion was decreased to 0.3. Uh, the patient still oliguric, uh, very positive uh, in terms of uh, uh, three liters, and they gave Lasix and didn't improve. The creatinine is 4.6 with a high BUN and a potassium of 5.6. As you can imagine where this issue is going. So which type of renal replacement therapy, do you have any specific uh, uh, 
uh, uh, technique that you would recommend to this patient, uh, and then the perennial question of early versus delay initiation of renal replacement therapy. Anybody? So I'll take the question first. I think that in terms of uh, which therapy, clearly in the common knowledge or the way we think about this, somebody who's very and stable, CRT might be better tolerated. Mm -hmm. But when this has been studied in randomized trials, we can also support people living in hemodialysis uh, with vasopressors. I think it all depends on the expertise and uh, 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 what you do at your, at your ICU. We probably will start with CRT. In terms of the early versus delay, I think, again, there's really never been any studies that have shown this. I would be more concerned uh, in this patient in terms of we're approaching day three. We're weaning off the base repressor support, and we really <clears throat> are unable to get fluid off. So probably initiating therapy to remove fluid would not be a bad idea. Anybody, any other comments on that? No? Neil? We would randomize this patient into the study. <laughs> which is, you will immediately. Majority, has a, majority is supposed to be finished. It's more than 2,500 patients randomized already. Who should qualify with this cirrhosis? That uh, will be exclusion criteria. So a couple of things. Uh, we, we would use CRRT um, in a patient that was still on norepinephrine. Um, you know, it's a, a tricky issue because if you take fluid off um, or you give Lasix, um, you know, you're assuming that the patient's on the flat part of the starving curve and that you've got more preload than you need. Otherwise, you're going to be decreasing stroke volume when you take fluid off. Um, the other piece of information is it looks like that, you know, with the uh, patient septic shock, normal renal function, you know, as the capillaries heal, they'll start auto-diuresing, and you may speed that up. Uh, with the little ASICs, if the lactate has normalized and they're not on nor epi. But if a patient's going into renal failure, you know, then you'll have to take fluid off with uh, CBB HD. Okay. So this patient, um, we will, okay. I, I will go to the uh, dialysis option later on. Which type of nutrition do you recommend in this one? Anybody? You will use parenteral, right? If the GI is working, you will start in the enteral uh, feeding. So she was started in CBVHDF. Um, eventually, she was achieved by neutral fluid balance by day seven. Seems very fast to me. Uh, but anyway, that's the case. The blood cultures were positive for Aromonas veronae. Uh, and over two days uh, uh, later, the norepinephrine and the sedation were suspended. So she got better. Uh, this patient was a high mortality risk of 90% plus, but anyway, she got better. The saturation and the ventilatory parameters improved. Um, now the patient eventually is ready for a spontaneous trial. Uh, TPs or pressure support? It's a question for the last 25 years. <laughs> but there are recent literature on that. Well, we, we would use, we would, a TP's equivalent, but it runs zero and zero on the ventilator. Oh, you will go to zero, zero? Yeah. Ah. Uh, because that's, so I know that there's a that trial in JAMA that uh, says also says otherwise, but if you think logically and physiologically, the, the role of a spontaneous breathing trial is to assess how the patient's gonna be, is, is the patient gonna be able to breathe without support from the ventilator, right? The, the best approximation of how the, the amount of work of breathing the patient has to do is to not give them any support. Even small amounts of fresh support or, or small amounts of heat or tube compensation substantially lower the work of breathing. So, so then you say, well, what about this trial in JAMA which shows you extubate more people? No, no, no. Well, I think that gets to your pretest probability when you look at, when you select patients from a trial. And if your pretest probability of passing an SBT is very high, then it doesn't matter which uh, which one you use, and you're only going to tip the scale towards more successful excavations. But but I think from a from a common sense standpoint, 
um, it, it makes more sense to, to see what the patients are going to be like after you've uh, taken them to bed. Neil, uh, let me push back a little bit on this. Uh, many years ago, and um, you know, unfortunately, I go a long time back in this in this history. Uh, and after Andres did all of his uh, different studies, there was one study that said that the number needed to treat on pressure support versus uh, T-tube, I know that you're not talking about T-tube here, uh, was, uh, was seven. So for every seven patient, you will get one extra patient uh, out with pressure, with a pressure support of seven centimeter of water. Uh, that doesn't go into calculation. Um. So I think the, these trials are, as you said, those, those Spanish studies were done in the, in the 90s right. um, and compared press support seven on zero versus two hours of TPs, similar to the, to the recent uh, JAMA paper. Two hours is probably a long time. Too long. Uh, and so I, I don't, I'm not sure it's fair to compare two hours of no support versus uh, some support. Okay. So, that's, so that's one issue. And they're all underpowered for actually looking at differences in post uh problems. And, and the question is whether you want to, what's the relative risk of extubating somebody prematurely and having them fail extubation, and in a worst case scenario, not being able to re-intubate them and have a catastrophic outcome, versus, yeah, maybe leaving, maybe stressing patients uh, more than you absolutely had to, and you might have got them off the vent uh, one day earlier. It's not, it's not clear what the right answer is. Okay. Any other comments, gentlemen? No. We use TVs. Okay. And I would say we would use pressure support of five, most likely. And I think that what I would say is that there's a lot of uh, arguments that I think are valid when you look at the different options. But ultimately, my belief is that the, the strongest evidence is for protocolized approach and to make sure that your ICU mm -hmm. learns how to do things in a systematic way. And the more they do it, yeah. the more comfortable they That's get. That's extremely with it. important. So, where yeah. you do a TP, zero over zero or five over zero, if you have empowered your great therapist colleagues to identify who's safe for it, to do it, have a time frame and evaluate these things promptly, I think that's just get the motivation to extubate it. Okay. <clears throat> Any other comment? Phil, are you okay with that? Yeah. I mean, I think that. The, to understand which test you're going to use and the false negatives and false positives you're going to get. Uh, you know, if, if the more pressure support you use, the, you know, the more patients that you're going to extubate that will have to be reintubated. Uh, if, if you use zero, zero, no TPs, you're probably going to hear in the other direction. And if you use a TPs, um, or zero P, you know, you're saying that you don't think what we call physiologic P is important in judging ability to wean. If you believe in physiologic P, if you believe that you want to try to reproduce the circumstance when the tube's out and you use five. Okay, so um, the final uh, evolution, she was wean. Um, after two spontaneous breathing trial with a uh, pressure support, five and zero for 30 minutes. So um, uh, that is the end of the case. Um, I really wanted to thank this panel here for their superb, not only interpretation of the literature, but the experience and the knowledge. Guys, thank you so much for your help. Yes. Can I make uh, one comment? I looked at my watch and it said, uh, I think it's 13 to four. I was waiting for the four years. Yeah. A series of questions. <laughs> yeah, that, that happens four days later and then she died. No, I'm just kidding. So, uh, and, and to the audience, thank you for your participation and for staying so late. So, and to the team from Juan and the, uh, everybody in Nutrition for putting this case together. Uh, so, my uh, appreciation for that. So, thank you and good afternoon. So, anybody's going to close this uh, or that's it? So, we're done for today. We're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.